A Participatory Economy, Robin Hanel's new book on post-capitalism is out now. Thomas Piketty describes it as a key contribution and a must-read. I talk about the book with Robin Hanel in the second part of a special three-part episode of Pep Talk, coming up next. Could you please tell us uh, what you see as the alternative? Welcome to Pep Talk, the participatory economy podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. I'm your host, Mitchell Strapancha, coming to you from Chicago. In this episode, we will discuss the middle third of the book, A Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel. Um, published, the book is published by AK Press, and indeed I am joined by the author, Robin Hanel, who is joining us from Portland, Oregon in the United States. Robin, hello, and welcome to the show. Great to be with you. Let's talk about the book. The, we're talking about the middle third of the book. Uh, there are three chapters um, in the book um, that comprise the middle third. Uh, one regarding work and income, another one regarding participatory annual planning, and we'll explain what that means, and one regarding reproductive labor. So let's talk about work and income and uh, topics related to that theme. Um, you start off among a number of topics that you raise in the work and income chapter regarding what's referred to as making sure that jobs are balanced. Let's start off with something simple, and we've talked about this before. What do you mean by work that's balanced? And how do you balance it, whatever that's supposed to mean? Okay. Well, I mean, the first thing is there's still going to be work. And, I mean, work, the, the choice of the word work implies that there's something unpleasant about it, at least part of the time, that it's not just, um, you know, what people choose to do on their own. And, and that's actually, I mean, it's worth just thinking a little bit about that because there's a lot of discussion amongst, you know, visionaries, economic visionaries. I mean, there are some people who think that automation is going to proceed to the point where nobody's going to have to do any work anymore. I mean, it's this vision of everything that is work has been automated. Um, and I think that is unlikely. I think there is always going to be work, even if it's just in the form of somebody has to show up, you know, at a certain time and be there for a certain number of hours. And there may be a day where they didn't feel like showing up. So the whole idea that there aren't going to be somewhat unpleasant tasks that will continue to have to be performed by somebody um, into the indefinite future. Um, so that's where we start. We start from that assumption. That doesn't mean that in a participatory economy, there are all sorts of reasons to think that work's going to be a hell of a lot more pleasant than it is in capitalism. Because in a participatory economy, it's being run by people who have to do the work and the unpleasant tasks. So if there's a way to organize work to be less unpleasant and more pleasant, We've empowered the people who have an interest in doing that to, to finally be able to do it. Their employers in capitalism really never had any incentive to do that. But anyway, having said all that, well, then the question becomes, um, if work is going to have some pleasant tasks, some tasks that are more pleasant, some tasks that are, are less pleasant, well, is it fair that some people should have jobs that have all of the unpleasant tasks while other people have jobs that have all of the more pleasant tasks? And, and our first response on that is there's nothing fair about that. That would be unfair. Um, so that's what we call balancing for desirability that all other things being equal. Now, there may be another way to take care of that, and I'm going to come back to it in a minute. But it would be just unfair for everybody to be compensated the same while some people are caring, while some people are performing a majority of the unpleasant tasks and other people aren't. A second kind of balancing would be for empowerment. And the idea here is that in workplaces, some tasks help you understand what are the decisions that the workplace faces about what they're going to be doing. New technologies, new products, new ways of you know, organizing work so that it's more pleasant. So 
part of I mean, part of what goes on in a workplace is people are sitting around discuss. They're, they're spending part of their work time sitting around and discussing all those issues. Um, in the past, almost in every economy you can imagine, that was being done by a relatively small number of people in workplaces. Um, and not by everybody. And I, we think that's part of the reason um, that workers have been have been disempowered in terms of their work lives, and that overcoming that is really going to be an immense task that's going to take a long time. I mean, think about this. If workers in capitalism and workers in feudalism, if workers in slavery, if workers for thousands of years, you know, have never been in a position where they could make decisions and they were carrying out the tasks that helped them and prepare them to be, you know, to participate in decision making about workplace. Why are they going to believe that suddenly somehow this is something that's now possible? And so what we mean by empowering is reorganizing job structures so that everybody's job contains at least some empowering tasks. And if there are tasks that are either particularly undesirable to perform or tasks that in no way empower you in workplace decision-making discussions and procedures, then those should be shared by everybody. Um, they shouldn't be simply the exclusive you know, tasks of of, of one group of people in a workplace. You bring up one idea that um, I seldom think about when it comes to talking about the arrangement of work, about terms and things of thinking about it in terms of uh, unpleasantness or not. Um, and I think that's a useful metric here. And um, um, I wonder if maybe that might be useful for determining whether or not um, a, a, a someone's collection of work tasks, their their job in effect. Um, if it has, if that's one way to determine if whether or not something would be um, uh, balanced or not. Uh, what do you think about this or how else would you propose that um, people should go about balancing work by these criteria? You know, this is a, you raise a very interesting point. And when Michael Albert and I first started thinking about this, we didn't really distinguish between empowerment and desirability. Mm. We conflated them. And I think there's a reason for that because there's a tremendous correlation. I think there's a very high correlation between job, you know, tasks in workplaces that are empowering and tasks in workplaces that are more desirable. So we never distinguished between the two early on. And we just talked about balancing jobs. And what we meant was for both those things. But as time went on, we came to the conclusion that those two things are not exactly the same. And those two things are not perfectly correlated. And there's also another important issue at hand. There's another way to take care of one of them fairly, but you can't take care of the other one that way. So... One way to take care of differential unpleasantness of tasks is to balance everybody's job for desirability. That if they've got a task they're performing for three hours that's highly desirable, then you match that up with a task that's less desirable that they have to do for two hours or something like that. So you could always do that, but there's another way to compensate. Suppose you didn't. Suppose you allowed jo some jobs to be more pleasant on average and some jobs to be less pleasant on average in a workplace. Well, then you could compensate any of the workers who are doing the less pleasant jobs with greater income and reward. And we're proposing that workers in their workplace should evaluate people and on the grounds of do any of us deserve greater reward than any of the rest of us? So if you didn't balance for desirability, you could handle it that way as well. And one of the things I should be very clear is we're proposing that this be done 
by workers in their workplace as they see fit. It's not outsiders that are coming in and telling them how to balance their jobs or organize them in this way or that. This is a recommendation that workers in their own workplace should do as they see fit, you know, in their own workplace. Um, on the other hand, with empowerment, um, there's another reason that you want to balance for empowerment. And that is you want to overcome all of the historical legacy that would lead people to reasonably be hesitant to fully embrace the idea that they're going to jump in and be very active participants in workplace decision making. And so if you don't balance for empowerment, our, our feeling is you'll what will happen to you is what we know actually did happen in Yugoslavia. In Yugoslavia, they had a system of worker self-managed socialism from basically 1951 up into the 1970s, early 80s. And in many ways, it worked remarkably well. But one of the things they did not do was balance jobs for empowerment. And one of the things that, I mean, there, there were literally dozens of doctoral dissertations that were done by economic, you know, graduate students about the, you know, what went on in this new economic experiment in Yugoslavia and what was it like in the workplace. And every single one of those remarked upon the fact that early on, there was a lot of active participation in workplace meetings, attendance, you know, number of people raising their hand and speaking rather than just sitting there like lumps on a log while somebody else comes in and says, well, we've studied this and, you know, hold your hand up if you agree. And basically what happened was they did not balance for empowerment. They had a very traditional job structures. 10% of the people there were doing the managerial tasks and everybody else was just doing what they always have been doing. And, and as a result, there's very, very strong empirical evidence that over time, participation in workplace management in Yugoslavia atrophied. And so we don't want that to happen. Um, so we feel like balancing for empowerment is necessary to overcome the legacy of workers not believing that participating was even was ever going to be worthwhile. Um, and over and and therefore you don't want, you know, there's no way to compensate for unbalanced empowerment, you know, that whereas you could, in theory at least balance for unpowered desirability by simply differential material reward. Um, suppose, here's a question for you, and kind of along these same lines. Um, it, it, it's really cool that you're suggesting that you're offering each workplace within a participatory economy to figure out for themselves um, uh, how to balance work for desirability and empowerment. Um, but suppose I'm starting a brand new workplace or maybe even a small business in the here and now, and I want to set up a kind of um, balancing work arrangement. How should I do that? What would you recommend? Any suggestions? I don't see any reason that, I mean, we have, there are lots of cooperatives, worker cooperatives um, in the, in the United States. Um, in a lot of the European countries, there are far more workers cooperatives. Um, the famous Mondragon worker cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain mm -hmm. and in Northern Italy, um, you know, a third of what's produced, more than a third of what's produced is produced by cooperatives of one kind or another rather than sort of traditional, you know, capitalist owned firms. And I see no reason that in any of those, you know, existing cooperatives that we could not balance jobs you know, so that we could, there's no reason that jobs could be not balanced for empowerment. And if cooperatives wanted to encourage all their members to become more active in decision-making, it would seem to me that that would be an important thing to do. And there's no reason that you can't, I mean, the problem with balancing for desirability is um, there's outside pay structures. So if you're a cooperative, a worker's cooperative, but you exist in a capitalist environment, well, then all those capitalist firms basically operate and generate a labor market. 
And that labor market, the capitalist labor market, will reward more productive labor, more highly than less productive labor. And if you don't do that in your workers' cooperative, you risk losing the more skilled people. Now, once the economy is an economy where everything is a cooperative, then you don't have that sort of competitive problem to deal with in terms of balancing. Um, but certainly with regard to empowerment, there's no reason that, and, and to, you know, I think if people take a look at a lot of the more, the more active and successful workers cooperatives, they're always looking for ways, you know, to encourage broader and fuller participation in decision-making on the part of all their members. But usually, but sometimes in my view, unfortunately, they don't realize, well, if you really want to be serious about that then make sure that everybody has tasks that actually do empower them about the kind of issues, you know, that have to be decided. Don't allow just a few of your members of the cooperative to mop, monopolize those tasks. In uh, Again, in the chapter on work and income, we talk about, well, the, the, the payment arrangement for um, in, in a participatory economy, that of um, uh, effort and sacrifice is being the only um, um, norm uh, that was deemed uh, fair in which a participatory economy advocates. Um, but there's also a, a another factor that's related to this, um, and I sometimes hear it described as effort and sacrifice tempered by need. And you talk about that some in the book. Can you elaborate on that? And how does need play a role into this? I mean, obviously, there are people who don't work can't work, you know, the very young, the very old people who may be um, ill or unable to work for whatever reason. But tell us more about what your think is, thought is with regards to need in a participatory economy. Well, one way to think about this is what's a fair economy and what's a humane economy. And it depends on how you define things. Some people define a fair economy to mean it's both just, it, it's characterized by economic justice, and it is humane. And humane would be, here is somebody who has not sacrificed any more than somebody else. They, have no, they, they haven't put any more effort in than anybody else, but now they have some need that, the other, you know, that, that, that other people don't have. They've contracted some illness or... So it's clear to us that, and, and, and let me put, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this as well. Early on, we really didn't distinguish between effort and sacrifice. We just sort of lumped it all together and called it effort. Mm. So I think, I think that there's a subtle distinction there and that both things need to be taken into account with regard to fairness. And we also really did not at first think about well, beyond just being fair in how it is that people are, are rewarded, I mean, is there anything else that we have to take? Is there some other thing that we have to take into account in terms of income distribution? And so we said, of course, we need to have, you know, we need some some of income distribution, some of consumption rights, you know, have to be based on need. Um, but we see that as being established more or less by sort of normal political procedures. Um, for instance, I mean, children have need and well, so we need to provide for the needs of children who we don't expect to go to work. We don't expect them to make sacrifices, but there should be allowances for children. Um, at some point people are going to retire and then they're not working anymore. So they're not going to have effort ratings. Well, do we just, I mean, when they retire, do they stop receiving income? No, of course they don't. I mean, we have Social Security. And then the question always is, well, is the Social Security, you know, more generous or less generous? You know, providing for need, it seems to us, are important political issues that will have to be just settled by, above and beyond, sacrificing people of a work age, who are working during the working part of their lives, who are healthy, who don't have disability. Besides, there's, there's tons of other people. I mean, 50% of population is not of that category. 
when you talk about older people, retired people, disabled people, young people, children, kids in school. Um, so you still have to talk about, well, what are the income rights that these other people, this other 50% of the population have? Um, and we certainly envision, you know, an economy that would have that, that would have that would have generous accommodation for incomes, you know, for those who have need, who for those who for whatever reason have greater needs and or are not in the workforce. And then the other thing I could say about that is when I imagine a participatory economy in a, in, a, in, in a country like the United States, which is very economically advanced, and I ask, well, how much need, how generous could those, you know, need based income provisions be? And then I compare it to, well, what about a country like the Republic of the Congo, where the economy just technologically is not nearly as far advanced? Well, it's probably the case that in the Republic of the Congo, it would be harder. It would be more difficult for them, you know, to have need based, you know, income as generous as in the United States until their economies develop. So that'd be something that has to be settled. It has to be taken into account. It has to be settled. It's more or less, I think, a democratic process. Um, in terms of making those decisions. And there's no reason to believe that the right decision for, for economies with very different levels of economic development wouldn't be different for some period of time. Continuing on with chapter five in the book, that's where we talk about participatory annual planning. Um, and you kind of make the distinction regarding annual planning, regarding other kinds of planning that you kind of mention other uh, later on in the book, which we'll reserve for um, another um, episode. Um, you start this chapter by asking a question, who says no? And I'll pose the question to you to answer here. Who says no? And what are you saying no to? For me, I think this is almost the key, the, the single most important intellectual sort of issue or point that we want to make. I mean, in my mind, it is. Um, now, first, Annual planning is going to take place in the context of investment plans and various development plans that will already have been decided by procedures we're not going to talk about today, procedures we talk about later. But that means um, a lot of what people have always thought about economic planning. We're making proposals about how investment planning should be made and how it is that education planning, environmental planning, long run strategic, you know, international economic planning, how is any economy going to do that? How would we recommend that a participatory economy do that? So we're gonna make recommendations about all that, but it's important to understand those plans already decide a whole bunch of things that are gonna be done this year. So a whole bunch of decisions about what has to be done this year are already decided by those other plans. For instance, how much are we going to have to invest and how much are we going to invest in making this kind of machine rather than that kind of machine? That's all, divide, that's all going to be decided by an investment plan before the annual planning process ever begins. The other thing to think about is there really are, I mean, one vision of post-capitalist economies is a vision where you still have a lot of markets. And one place where you could now use markets, I mean, after you do investment planning and development planning of different kinds, you could then use markets, you know, to sort of take care of how things are handled during the year. And we think there are important reasons not to do that. The way I would put it most simply is, if you can avoid doing that, and you can avoid doing that, and it's not too cumbersome, and it would work just fine, then by all means avoid that. Because the detrimental effects of even using markets in the context of investment plans and development plans, I believe has proven over time to be very, very counterproductive to the ultimate goals that people have for a socialist economy. Building solidarity amongst people, um, making sure that things are fair and equitable. All of that, I believe, would be undermined if we needed to use, I think all of that tends to be undermined 
when we have market exchanges, when the bottom line is that in a market process, in a market exchange, each participant in the exchange is, has every incentive to try and take maximum advantage of the other. That's what market exchanges are all about. Mm -hmm. So if we can, uh, if we can come up with a sensible way to handle things that avoids that, you know, to the greatest extent possible, then I think there's a really strong argument for doing so. And that's the way that people should consider our proposal for annual participatory planning. Have we made have, have we made a proposal that will work and that avoids and that avoids all of the predictable pitfalls? Um, and and so the first thing is, well, we also have experience with planning. And for the 20th century, the so-called socialist economies engaged in a kind of planning um, that was commonly called central planning. Another name for it by people who became critical of it was it's authoritarian planning. Mm -hmm. It's a form of planning where some sort of planning agency, perhaps presided over by the Politburo of a communist party, but the planning bureau, um, and they may ask questions to get information from the production units. But in the end, that central authority is seen as only they can have the big picture in mind. The individual workplaces can't. And so they're the ones that have to come up with a plan unless we're just leaving it to markets to decide who produces what. Um, so we're proposing something that is an alternative to authoritarian planning, and it's an alternative to markets. And we call it participatory annual planning. And the first question is, well, when you're planning, doesn't somebody or some process have to say no to some people? No, you can't do something. And the answer is yes, of course. So what we think we have proposed, I would describe it in this way. It's a kind of collective self-policing. In central planning, it's the central planning agency that does the policing. And if every workplace self-policed, then presumably it would just do exactly what it wanted to do. And that wouldn't work at all. So, and then the question is, well, what would collective self-policing look like? And the way I would, I mean, and when somebody is looking at our proposal for what it is that we are saying can and should be done, what they should be asking themselves is, have we described a process where workplaces and neighborhood consumer councils can propose what they want to do, but then discover whether what they've proposed is actually fair and efficient, taking the effects they have on other people into account? And have we proposed a process where not only is it possible for a workers council to, to know if what they've proposed to do is socially responsible, but for all the other workers councils and consumer councils to very quickly without a tremendous amount of energy or time put into it on their part, also see whether what a workers council has proposed is socially responsible. And socially responsible just means fair to others and also efficiently using social resources that belong to others. So what we think we have done is essentially describe the procedure that will lead self, that will lead workers councils and neighborhood consumer councils making their own suggestions about what they wanna do. And nobody revises those things for them. Only they can revise them. But the process will essentially allow all the other councils to rather quickly, without a lot of time and energy expended, to see whether or not these proposals are, in fact, socially responsible. And we think we've come up with a procedure that provides that information. And that's why we believe what we've proposed is a way for these workers' councils and neighborhood consumer councils to collectively self-police themselves without a central planning authority 
and without resort to market interactions and market competition. Another topic in the same chapter on participatory annual planning that you talk about in the subchapter, um, it refers to something called externalities. Um, uh, I know a little bit about this, um, but it basically, at least in my mind, refers to some kind of uh, pollutant or even just some un, um, uh, unexpected effect from an interaction in the economy. It could be good, it could be bad. Um, what do you mean by externalities? And how does a participatory economy account for, if it does, externalities? Okay. Um, yeah, let me just say, before answering that, I do believe that our annual participatory planning procedure is unique in the post-capitalist sort of literature mm. with regard to um, providing a way that collective self-policing can go on. I mean, I think that's one of the things that, that, that is a distinguishing characteristic of our overall proposal with regard to any other proposal that I've seen or studied out there in the literature. Now, um, I'm gonna answer, uh, so externalities, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer two, another question at the same time, because the answer is very similar. Hmm. In market economies, there are public goods as well as private goods. And market economies are notoriously inefficient in providing public goods um, relative to private goods. There's a tremendous bias in market economies to supply more private goods than actually makes sense, is efficient in very narrow economic terms, and to undersupply public goods as compared to the efficient amount of public goods. And another thing that is well known, it's been well known back to the time of, there's a famous economist named Alfred Pigou, who was the senior economic professor at Cambridge University in the early 19th century, in the early 20th century in, in, in England. And Pigou was the first economist who, who pointed out that in market economies, there are these things called externalities where a firm goes ahead and dumps a pollutant into a stream, and then somebody downstream has polluted water instead of clean water. And that's a negative externality. So there are other kinds of, there, there are both positive and negative externalities in market economies. And, and, and some of these are easily understood as pollutants, and some of these in some ways are more subtle. But it's sort of well known that in a market system, externalities will go unaccounted for in the pricing mechanism that the market system generates. And therefore you're gonna get a certain amount of inefficiency. Now defenders of market economies and defenders of capitalism would like to have us believe that these inefficiencies are rather small and that there are some sort of measures that we can take to sort of accommodate, the, to deal with them. And there are some measures you can take, you know, and you're better off if you take them than if you don't. Um, I think there's very little reason other than wishful thinking on the part of pro-capitalists to believe that these externalities are always rather insignificant and few and far between. I think the actual evidence, when it, if anybody would bother looking at it, that it's a really big problem. Mm. So the question is, when we, when we originally designed our annual participatory, participatory planning procedure, um, we really did not incorporate any special features that would handle either public goods or externalities any better than a market system did. But we have now, and they're in there. And we now have created a way, think, the, the easiest way to think about it is, you want to make it as easy for people to express their desires for public goods, things like parks, um, as to express their desires for private goods, things like a pair of shoes. It should be, you, the goal should be make it just as easy for people to express their desires for these public goods as private goods. And if you look at our annual planning procedure and when it is that people are going to propose you know, when it is the consumers are going to be proposing how much public goods they want, 
versus how much private goods they want. We basically, we've even the playing field so that it's as easy for people to express their desires for public goods as private goods. And since we've lived in market economies now for two or 300 years, overcoming this bias is, I believe, such an important thing that needs to be achieved that you could even you could even tilt the playing field for some number of years in the direction of public goods. And we've pointed out how you could easily do that in the annual planning procedure as well. Now with externalities, what we've, what we've proposed is you would need to create something called communities of affected parties. So externalities are things that a consumer does or things that a producer does that have and let's just deal with the negative, that have negative effects on other people. Um, you have a factory that is, you have a cement factory, and it's spewing out particular per, particulate matter, and it falls down over some sort of area, you know, that is adjacent to or close enough or downwind. Well, it's the people who live in that geographical area near that factory, they're the ones that are negatively affected. So what we have proposed is we need to create communities of affected parties, and they need to also play an active role in every round of planning in the annual participatory planning role, in the planning procedure. And we have empowered them to basically, what, what they do is, the way they participate is they say we would allow so much of that particular matter to be released. Well, why would they say anything other than zero? And our answer is, well, sometimes, sometimes zero would be ideal on the other, from a certain perspective. But zero pollutant might mean that it's almost impossible for, you know, us, for us to produce something. So the right answer might be that a certain amount of pollution makes sense um, because it has it, it's, a comp it's necessary for tremendous benefits in terms of what can be produced at all. Well, they get to say how much will they, they will tolerate in exchange for being compensated. So in the in annual planning, there's always going to be an estimate of what would be the compensation for you all over there that are victims of this kind of particulate matter pollution? What is the ongoing compensation? And given that, how much are you willing to say you want to tolerate? And what we've proved is that if you incorporate these communities of affected parties into the annual planning procedure, there's every reason to believe the incentives are such that you should basically reach what an economist would call the efficient level of pollution. Now, a reader of a participatory economy is not an economist. They're going to be somebody who is some sort of leftist, most likely. And the whole idea that there's an efficient level of pollution would be anathema. Um, on the other hand, I would just say, speaking as an economist, Zero pollution means that um, I'm not allowed to step on a blade of grass. So clearly there must be some level of activity in which we have some sort of damaging effect to some degree on the economy, you know, that is worth it. And the question is, I mean, up until now, capitalist economies in particular, you know, have polluted way more than is efficient and damage the economy to the point where we're about to, you know, we're, we're, we're now risking our, our extinction as a species um, because of emissions of greenhouse gases leading to climate change, which might be so severe within 10 or 10, you know, if, if the people at COP27 hmm. don't pick up the speed, you know, we're in serious danger of becoming the lemmings. Um, but nonetheless, in annual participatory planning, I mean, I would just recommend to readers, take a look at what we've proposed, see how it is 
we've basically generated a procedure that's going to require anybody who is emitting a pollutant to to be charged. They're going to be charged for it. They're going to be charged for it because it it is a cost. If you if 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 you produce something, then and if you use human labor, well, that's a cost to people if the work is unpleasant. So that's what you're supposed to be charged for. If you use a scarce resource, you know, that has an opportunity cost. So you should be charged for that. And if you are emitting pollutants that damage people and, you know, make people sick or damage people in certain ways or make the air smell bad, well, that's also a cost. And we, what we now believe is that in the annual planning process, we have now including procedures that are what economists call incentive compatible. Yep. Um, they're incentive compatible for the victims to honestly say, this is how much I'm a victim. And they're compatible for those who want to release the pollutants um, so that, well, if you want to release it, um, then you have to pay for it. Yeah. And that would be an incentive to, well, to the extent possible, not pollute. That's right. I mean, right, right now, <clears throat> I mean, in a market economy, we have pollution taxes sometimes. Right. And it says, look, I mean, if we don't tax you for issuing the pollutant, you're going to pollute, you're going to emit a lot more than is in any way efficient. Mm -hmm. The problem in a market economy is how do you know whether the, how do you know how high the tax should be? And there'll always be an argument over that. The one who's going to be charged the tax is going to try and finance a study that says it really doesn't cause much damage. And the person that is being damaged is going to finance a study saying, oh, no, no, I'm terribly damaged. So it's basically just political power that decides how high pollutant taxes are going to be in market economies. What we're proposing is a process that should not just be arbitrary how high is the tax or not. Um, and it shouldn't just be settled by the power of the polluting industry versus the political power of the victims of pollution to sort of, you know, to battle it out. That it's incentive compatible for everybody to actually reveal what is truly, you know, what are truly the effects as best they know them. Um, just for the benefit of listeners and viewers, um, Robin made reference to COP27, the Conference of the Parties and the 27th meeting of gatherings of um, representatives of countries from around the world who talk about um, the issue of uh, global warming, climate change, and the climate emergency, um, which in November 2022 was taking place in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, um, around the time that we're recording this episode. Um, moving on to the next chapter of the discussion, the last one we'll discuss for this episode, chapter six of the book, where we talk about reproductive labor. And here, I think we need to pause for a moment and get a little bit of bearing on what that means. So, Robin, what, is, what do you mean by reproductive labor? Right. Um, and let's also add in how important is it? Sure. So, one of the things that humans have to do is produce what leftists used to call the material means of subsistence. Or else uh, we would die. If we didn't produce food, if we didn't produce shelter, if we didn't produce some sort of clothing in climates that are freezing. Um, so sometimes human activity is primarily oriented toward that, that goal. Um, and that, I mean, our, 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 our name for that is economic act. We think of that as economic activity. Well, but there are other things that humans have to do and human societies have to do in order to, you know, continue through time. Um, we have to procreate. And my mother always used to, do, I, I had a mother who was an English teacher and she used to make a big point. Everybody says raising children. And she said, no, no, no. You raise chickens, you rear children. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that's an interesting point. Rearing children is a complicated, rearing children is more complicated and in many ways more time consuming and sometimes more frustrating, as Mitchell and I both know, mm -hmm. than just raising chickens. Chickens can be a pain in the butt too, but kids can be a bigger pain in the butt. So 
To be successful, any human society has to have procedures and institutions that govern the process of procreating and rearing the next generation. And rearing the next generation means, so there is caring labor, caring for infants, caring for ill, caring for the elderly. Um, there is there's just domestic labor, just housework, cooking, washing dishes. Um, and then there's something that you might think of as socialization, that the whole process of how does a new generation come to be socialized and educated so that they can take their place when their time comes, you know, as fully grown adults in society. I mean, that's also, all of these things are necessary for successful societies to persist throughout time. Now, a lot of people, I mean, a lot, a lot of people on the left, a lot of, I mean, socialist feminists, um, Marxist feminists, they call all this reproductive labor. And one of the reasons to call something labor is that it's not always pleasant. When you, to do, the people who have to do it, it's not always, you know, it, it's not it, it's not always the most pleasant thing in the world. Mm -hmm. It's work. It's like work. Um, so why not call it labor? It is work. <laughs> it is work. On the other hand, so if you want to emphasize the fact that it's work and therefore who does it and how they're compensated, you know, become important issues, both issues regarding efficiency, reg issues regarding fairness. So if you want to emphasize that, well, go ahead and call it reproductive labor. And I think in the chapter we actually do. We just call it reproductive labor. On the other hand, um, when you call things labor, that can also imply that, well, it's only labor is associated with the economy. And it also and, and if people associate labor with the economy, that would give the impression that it's only the only things in the economy are important in societies. And I'm a really strong believer that I have no idea. I mean, so what I call reproductive activity is what goes on and is governed by what I call the kinship sphere of social life. There's a whole sphere of social life that handles this. There's another sphere of social life that handles economic issues. And I, 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 I can see no reason to assume a priori that in any given society, the sphere of, of social life that handles reproductive issues is any more or less important than the sphere of social life that, that handles economic issues. So sometimes I would, I would opt for calling it reproductive activity so that we remind ourselves that it might be just as important. I mean, it's just as necessary that doesn't mean it's having as how it's being done is having as big an effect on what's going on in society as maybe what's going on in the economic sphere of life or the political sphere of life. But in any case, it's a whole area of human economic activity um, that certainly is very, very important. And what it basically consists of is procreating and rearing the next generation all the caring work that has to go into rearing children, educating children, caring for adults and those who are ill, um, just ordinary domestic work and housework, washing dishes and cooking, um, and socializing and a lot of what goes on in education in sort of the, in, in the education institutions is gonna be socializing the new generation to become adult and functioning members of society. So that's what we're talking about. And then the question is, well, how would you propose that this be done in a desirable way? And what feminist literature I think has done a brilliant job, you know, of, of demonstrating is how badly this is done in almost all societies today in almost all historic societies, how badly it's done from the point of view of whether it's done fairly and it is traditionally, you know, and most emphatically unfair that the burdens of carrying out this labor or activity fall more heavily on women than on men. Um, and the compensation 
for those who do this activity, you know, is is less than what is fair, that it is undercompensated. It's it's underappreciated, it's underrespected, it's undercompensated, and who has to do it and who doesn't, it's all very unfairly done. So I mean, whether you're a radical feminist, a socialist feminist, a Marxist feminist, whatever kind of feminist, there's a, an, an incredible literature, you know, documenting all of that, documenting the ills of patriarchal ways of carrying out um, reproductive labor or reproductive activity. What, what I think there has been far less of is serious thinking about, well, yeah, we know, all, we know about a lot of wrong ways to do this. What are better ways to do this? And I would just preface this whole, I, I would just say something about this whole chapter. This whole chapter is written trying to provoke more thoughts about how to do it in a way that's desirable, that's fair and efficient. And so our recommendations, I mean, and, and we did not, I mean, we didn't, we didn't ever write anything about this for decades. And partly that was because we just weren't sure what to write. Partly we weren't sure we were the right people to do it. And I'd also like to say that this chap this this chapter is the result of several articles that have now been published in journals that were jointly written by by socialist feminists, female socialist feminists, as well as as well as people like me. We were in a sense we we wanted we wanted help from you know the people who have been most active in in criticizing everything that's done badly um, in trying to. And just begin to start throwing out there some stuff so that everybody can look at it and see well would this would this solve the historic problems that we know we that, that we now have documented thoroughly um are there some dilemmas here are there some tough things that you have to think about are there some pros and cons that you have to weigh back and forth so that's the spirit in which this chapter is is included in the book and also um, some of the ways in which a participatory economy would handle that. Can you elaborate on that some? Yeah, um, the reproductive activity is gonna, I mean, let's look about when, where it's gonna take place. Um, I mean, one obvious place it's gonna take place is in the healthcare system. Another obvious place it's gonna take place is in the educational system. We're going to say that whether you think of reproductive activity going on in the economic sphere of social life or not, it is. And therefore, we're going to argue that it does go on there and you have to address that. And finally, it goes on in, you know, in people's households, in, inside people's families. So there's various places where it goes on. And the chapter doesn't attempt to describe a desirable educational system. It doesn't attempt to describe in full what a desirable healthcare system would look like. But in order to talk about reproductive activity at all, you have to make some, some minimal assumptions about how much of these things are being provided in the healthcare system and what does the healthcare system look like? What does the education system look like? But we're not trying to make a proposal about, you know, designing education or designing healthcare. Um, but we did make proposals about, at least in the economy, you know, what can you do and should you do? And in households, what can you do and should you do? And it's all in the context where we're assuming that there is, there is free public education for all, and we're assuming there is free healthcare for all. In the economy, the main proposals um, have to do with this. Inside a workplace, jobs are designed in a certain way. And they may be designed in a way that's unfair. They may be designed in a way that's unfair in, 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 from, from a gender perspective. That, um, well, some job is the job of secretaries are always the ones that are supposed to refill the, you know, grind the coffee and refill the coffee when the coffee is well, there's no reason for that. Um, so you can have workplaces 
where traditionally, because it's always been done that way, the female employees do certain tasks and, and the men don't. And there are tasks that the males only do when there's no reason that females can't do them. And so how are you going to deal with all that? And we propose that there should be very active women's caucuses inside workers' councils. And we, we, we want to empower, we've, we've suggested that they should be empowered to basically, so there's a general workers council that decides how everything's gonna be handled. And what if the women's caucus in that workplace thinks that those decisions that are majoritarian supported decisions are biased in some way? that they find objectionable. So we want to empower the caucus to bring that to attention of the workers' council and basically put a stay of execution on it if they feel very strongly about it. Basically say, you know what? This was voted through, but we have looked at this. This is particularly objectionable. And we want to simply put a stay of execution on it until there's further consideration. Okay. Suppose after further consideration, the majority opinion still is not to the satisfaction of the Women's Caucus and the Workers' Council. We propose that that not the side matters, that the work that then then the work then the Women's Caucus we've we've recommended the Women ca Women's Caucus should have the right to appeal the decision to the Women's Caucus for the Federation that this Workers' Council belongs to. Now, if they take the issue to the Women's Caucus for the Federation, there's two possibilities. The Women's Caucus of the Federation would say, nah, you're just, you're wrong. Or it would say, no, you're absolutely right. In which case that would go then back to the Workers' Council. Um, so we're basically proposing sort of a very elaborate set of procedures that would allow women's caucuses to far more seriously challenge practices in workplaces that they find objectionable on the grounds that in some way they are discriminatory toward women. Um, now you can extend this to, you know, you can also ask, well, what about lesbian you know, LBGT caucuses in workplaces. And, and, and I, I would have the same attitude toward that. What about, you know, what about caucuses for minorities, you know, for racial minorities within workplaces? And and I would I would say the same, but this is a chapter about reproductive labor, so it doesn't address those issues. But as soon as you start talking about this, obviously those other things are gonna come to mind. And And I think in the chapter, we make very clear that we think similar arguments can be made about those and, and similar kinds of proposals can be made about those. In a workers' council, you can combat sexism by empowering um, women's caucuses. In households, that's not so easy to do. Mm -hmm. Quite. And, and yet a lot of what is objectionable, you know, what feminists correctly have pointed out is objectionable in how it is that you know, that reproductive activity or labor is carried out is what goes on in households. Yep. I mean, one example, and and it's not so easy to get, and, and, and certainly they know for thousands of years, it does not prove very easy to do anything about. I mean, one very interesting experiment, I mean, this is a, a, an interesting piece of Cuban history. So the, the, the Cubans rewrote their constitution back probably 15, 20 years ago now. And in their constitution, it very clearly says, men must share equal responsibility for child rearing and housework. And it's right there in the constitution. And, and it was in the constitution because the Cubans Women's Federation was powerful enough to make sure that it got into the constitution. Mm -hmm. But that didn't necessarily change anything. <laughs> um, right. So you're you're facing a dilemma that we can't empower a women's caucus, you know, inside a house inside households. Now, there's no reason that there can't be, you know, inside inside. I mean, we have neighborhood consumption councils 
you know, with two or 3,000 families in them. There's no reason that we shouldn't have, you know, women's, a women's organization, a women's neighborhood organization that, you know, should be very active in terms of supporting women, you know, in their attempts to, you know, to overcome sexist dynamics inside their own households. On the other hand, I mean, it's a very ticklish issue whether you're going to empower them, you know, the way that you would empower a women's caucus in a, in a workplace. So in some sense, um, the issue becomes how do you draw attention, how do you support efforts in this area um, inside, ho inside households? Um, and what tools do you have to do that? Um, so we've made some suggestions and comments about that, but we've also pointed out some very ticklish areas in which it's not, there are conflicting goals. And in this case, the one that basically has to do with privacy. But in any case, um, yes, we've at least, hopefully we've opened debate on these subjects. What would a society have to do? I would put it this way. How could a society be, be, be immune, become immune from the justifiable criticisms that, that the feminist movements, you know, have made against present societies? And we just need a lot more people to get involved in thinking through what are the positive alternatives. The book is A Participatory Economy. Uh, Robin Hanel is the author. We've been speaking with him. And this has been Pep Talk, the Participatory Economy podcast the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as the participatory economy. To find out more, you can visit the website of the Participatory Economy Project that produces Pep Talk um, online at participatoryeconomy.org. Uh, there you can join in and sign up for uh, a regular newsletter that gets mailed out, uh, as well as uh, joining an online forum where you can discuss the issues like so those we've talked about in this episode about uh, breezed in the book, A Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel, published by AK Press. I'm Mitchell on behalf of Robin. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye for now. Thank you, Mitchell. Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? alternative. Self-management, democratic control of communities or workplaces, federal arrangements. Participatory democratic planning. Jobs, down a mix of empowered your nesting counts linked to one. Everyone gets to participate in a primary council. Please visit participatoryeconomy.org to find out more and subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, and see you at the next episode.